Harris. It's James Lowe from KJAG Radio giving you a call for your radio interview. How are you, my friend? Good, James. How are you doing? Pretty good, actually. So uh, we have got a great guest with us today. He joins us live here on our big broadcast. John D. Ventruli is with us. And I bet I just butchered your last name. I apologize. That's all right. I'm used to it. (laughs) So, John, there is a lot going on uh, in the world. Uh, You're also a uh, fantastic author. We're going to talk about your books here in a few moments as well. So, so John, let's talk about this um, situation with uh, good old worst first, Joe Biden. Um, his staff will not face charges for the improper handling of classified documents. Talk to us a little bit about this, my friend. Well, my question is, is, uh, you know, was it his staff or was it him? I mean, he, he had access to them. Um, you know, having dealt with classified documents from, you know, unclassified all the way up to top secret, you know, specialized compartmental information, you know, SCI stuff. Um, you know, where you have to be read in on, uh, those specific projects, you know, taking stuff home willy nilly and leaving it in the garage behind your Corvette or underneath a desk at an office, (laughs) that's not the way it's done. You got to lock it up and just going from one building to another on a base, you have to put it in a courier bag and there's, we have certain rules that, that apply. It's very, very protective. And you can't put it on a cell phone server either, period. So talk to us a little bit about uh, your experience with this, uh, how this um, is well, all handled and how this is all supposed to work. Um, from what I understand, particularly with the senators, uh, they are not allowed to take stuff out of their, uh, from a, uh, a skiff. Um, they don't take it home. Neither does the vice president. A president can, uh, when they leave office, is so they can write their memoirs. That even that I disagree with. I think that they should do that at the uh, uh, congressional library, and there's places there they can do it. And um, you know, these people when they leave office, you know, financially, as we've all seen, they're pretty well fit. So if you want to write a memoir and make millions of dollars, well, then you go back to where the information is and you do it there. And, and when they do ask for it, you need to return it. I I disagree with President Trump on that. I think he should have returned it. Yeah. Uh, I don't I have no idea why he didn't. Yeah. So, and Biden was completely wrong. When you look at the two, uh, they're both wrong. But I would definitely say, you know, Biden is is way more wrong than President Trump ever was. Yes. Yes. We have got a great guest with us today. He joins us live here. Uh, what exactly should happen, uh, at least in, in, in your opinion, in, in this case? Well, from what we've all heard is the, uh, as, uh, the investigator, her, you know, came back, you know, well, you know, he had good intentions and, you know, he's not mentally fit. Well, I hate to tell you, uh, when he did take those documents, he was mentally fit and it doesn't matter. Um, if it was me, I'd be buried under the jail right now. I'd lose my clearance. I'd lose everything. You don't do that. You know, we had a young sailor that just happened to take some uh, pictures near a submarine, and he lost his clearance, and he's gone. Um, You know, we've had people that drop the ball on information. They start talking outside of the bars, and somebody overhears them. They're gone. You know, just simple things like that. Now, taking classified documents home, you know, that is a violation of law. And as we all know, and everybody said it, nobody's above the law. Well, apparently people are above the law and this is wrong and sending the wrong message, not just to the American people, but those who handle classified information. We have got a great guest with us today. He joins us live here on our big broadcast. So what is the official stance when it comes to having classified documents in someone's home. Well, 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 what is that exactly? Well, it doesn't go in your home. So we can set up a skiff in a, 
a house, and we do do that for general officers um, at higher levels. Um, we can do it for certain persons. I'm sure the vice president has that. Um, some senators may have that, such as the Speaker of the House or the Leader of the Senate. Um, I'm not sure, but we sit, we will actually set up a skiff in their house, and that's where they can view the documents. But again, it has to be couriered over in a sealed and locked containers to get it there. You don't put it in a cardboard box and just leave it sitting around in a closet, a garage, anywhere. It has to be a secured facility. Wow. <laughs> Clearly both Trump and Biden just didn't give a crap. <laughs> That is well, just amazing the other thing me. is this. I guarantee you there is a skiff at Mar-a-Lago. There yeah. was when he was president. I guarantee you. Now, was it there, you know, post? Probably because he has classified documents when he when he went, took it back to write his, his uh, memoirs. Um, and whether or not it's still there, I don't know. I'm not in Mar-a-Lago. I'm not part of his detail. <laughs> I know for a fact that sending a, you know, uh, FBI SWAT team in when you got Secret Service guys in there. That's kind of a uh, that's kind of a showcasing thing. Oh yeah. I don't think that was necessary. I think they just could have walked in and said, "Hey guys, we're here to collect this stuff," and they would have been like, "All right, here you go." You know. Yeah. It's over there, and you know, you know, is it politics? Absolutely. <laughs> We have got a great guest with us today. He joins us live here on our big broadcast. So do you believe that equal justice is impossible given how much the Department of Justice and the FBI kind of lean towards Biden and his administration? You know, it's funny you ask that. I was just with a friend of mine. We were out. Uh, we do a ski event every year, and he's very well politically connected, and he told me one group of persons he does not trust in D.C., and that is the FBI. Wow. And he's been around there for for decades. And he, if anybody knows, he does. And, wow. You know, somebody telling me that at that level, I'm like, dadgum. You know? <laughs> um, yeah, and I mean... You, when you when you do that, and honestly, when you look at the FBI and what they were built for back in the day, it was it was a good idea. But now you look at the state departments. You know, they have their own labs. They have their own investigative capabilities. They have a lot of this stuff. So you can actually break the FBI apart and make it much smaller and really detail it down to, you know. You could detail it down to anti-terrorism within the U.S. and, you know, look at our border. They're going to be very busy over the next couple of decades trying to find all these sleeper cells so that are infiltrating. And, yeah. you know, they can, they, we can walk them back. And if not, I mean, we can take them apart and just start anew. Um, we, have, we have got a tremendous guest with us today. He joins us live here on our big broadcast, John D. Portrayal is with us, and uh, we are America is the latest from him, a voice from the silent majority. Let's talk a little bit about your book, We Are America. Talk to me a little bit about your writing process, John, for this incredible book. So the book is, uh, I've identified 15 issues that affect the United States, and it ranges from a lack of national, a national strategy we have no idea. So basically you're getting on a cruise ship and the captain says you're going to Europe. And then eight days later, you got a new captain. He says you're going to the crib. You never make it to shore. You're just floating around the water. You know, you're lost. And that's where our strategy is. We don't really have a solid strategy to push the United States forward. And that's why you see a lot of these, you know, willy nilly ideas going on. Every time we have a new president, executive orders come flying off the desk and executive orders just, just keep going. So, we need a true strategy. And then we also talk about immigration. I talk about the war on drugs. The strategy is wrong. I talk about redesigning Department of Defense. I talk about our budget. You know, instead of doing a one-year budget, the U.S. government should actually do a 10-year budget and how that would work. And I talk about um, the Middle East. And I talk about all sorts of stuff. Um, basically, and a lot of it is, is how to get away from China. 
If you want to know why China's military is stro- so strong, quit going to Walmart. Quit <laughs> buying cheap stuff. <laughs> you know, we we finance China, and we need to quit it. So, so this um, book, but it, it, it yes, actually get, get, the way I wrote ahead, it, as I say, here's the problem, here's some facts, and I actually give you sustainable solutions. I don't, I'm, I'm not one of those people that complains all the time unless I have a solution. I try and dig down, and that's what I was known for in the military, is like, if you can't figure it out, give it to John, he'll come up with a simple solution. And I usually do. That's and, awesome. you know, and it's sustainable. And I try and get, like, you look at the Middle East problem, you know, I, I say, it's not our problem. It's the Middle East problem, it's Europe's problem, it's China's problem. Why are we still there? And I explain why. And it goes back to post-war II, Bretton Woods agreements that we had. Um, so, and I start walking it away, and I say, okay, this is how we fix this. That's awesome. That's fantastic. We have got a great guest with us today. He has got a fantastic book called We Are America, Voice from the Silent Majority. So uh, talk to me a little bit about uh, your writing process. Did you use notes and outline? How, how did you bring this thing to life? Um you know, unfortunate for, for people, it's kind of written like a white paper. I, like I said, I just, you know, um, you know, I, I identify the problem and I just dig into it. And I just try and say, okay, where, where's this problem? So you look at illegal immigration. People say, well, the problem is people are coming across the border. Well, that's not the problem. The problem is when you cut it down to the core, there's a lack of employment in Central America. Well, why is there a lack of employment in Central America? You know, we provided a lot of security in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and even 90s, you know, you know stabilizing these countries. Well, we stabilize them in security. But we never stabilize them economically. And the economic way is you build infrastructure. So if we get down there and we do some simple infrastructure and we take that low skill and medium skill manufacturing, you know, making straws, making chopsticks, you know, and take it from China and put it in Central America. Well, we kill two birds with one stone. We're, we're reducing China's capability, but we're also building up our own neighborhood. And that's really what I want to focus on, is I want to focus on our own neighborhood. Just because your neighborhood is safe, when you leave the gate, you go on the other side of the wall, guess what? You know, it's not so safe. You want to make your whole town safe, your whole area, your whole state. So, and that's really what I focus on. But I also say that, you know, they have a huge corruption problem. So when you get the corruption down to this level, then we'll give you this. You get it down to a lower level, we'll give you the next next step. You get down to the third level, you get the next step and keep going down. But you just don't message to the politicians in Central America. You have to message to the people and you have to educate the people and, then, you know, and that's what I focus on. And it's basically three steps for immigration. It is control the border, guest worker program uh, that helps us out, and then building that infrastructure down there once they get the corruption down. That is awesome. We have got so, it. Yes, yeah. go ahead, my friend. And there's, yeah, so like even the war on drugs, you know, I talk about that. Um, you know, even after I wrote it, you know, I, I looked at other things and I was like, well, you know, I might be wrong. You know, and I'm, I'm open to it. If somebody can prove me wrong, then please do. And I'll, I'll actually be quiet and listen and take notes. <laughs> and I awesome. think that's one of the biggest problems we got in this world right now is nobody wants to shut their mouth and actually open their ears and open their mind. And I talk to people all the time, and I can tell when they're not listening and they're developing the next argument. And I snap my fingers in their face. I'm like, hey, shut it down, open your mind, and listen. And when I explain it to them, they're like, oh, okay. Yeah, now I get it. <laughs> so, That's awesome. Yeah. Now I get it. That's great. The The book Good. is called We Are America, A Voice from the Silent Majority. So, uh, so John, this, this book is incredibly well written. Tell me a little bit about what some of your goals are for the book. Well, you know, the biggest goal, even the fellow I was talking about earlier, the guy who's political clinic, we we're trying to figure out how to, you know, because he he doesn't like he 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 and I are somewhat similar in thought. You know that we do have political issues, major issues within D.C. and how do we fix that? You know, I told him I said the biggest you know problem is that we, when you look at the media, you look at the message that people are sending, whether they're politicians or news heads, is they're not sending the right message. They're sending their rhetoric, 
And we got to educate the people. Once the voting population says, hey, actually, that's a good idea, and the polls say that's a good idea, you'd be amazed what's going to happen. And when you look at the polls, there are well over 50% of the popula- voting population are pretty moderate. And I've got friends of mine that are diehard Republicans and diehard Democrats, but when I talk to them, I'm like, you know, like my Republican buddies, you know, they're like, oh, you know, they're talking about these rhinos. And I'm like, dude, you smoked up. Really? You're not a, you're not a, you're not a diehard Republican either. You're smoking dope as you're saying this, you know? And, you know, when I'm like, you know, Republicans the same or Democrats same way. And I'm like, you own a gun, right? They're like, yeah. And I'm like, all right, well, you're not really a, a diehard Democrat. You know, you guys wake up. And I tell people all the time, if you just vote, vote Democrat party, or you just vote Republican party, when it comes to the presidential election, honestly, just don't even show up because it's not your vote that counts. It's people like me, the moderates, the swing votes that go back and forth and vote. That's who decides. And when you look at those people, honestly, we're almost split 50, 50 on who we're going to vote for. So, well, that is awesome. The, the book is called, we are America, a voice from the silent majority. So what's next for you as an author, my friend? Well, I, you know, every four years, I don't really change much because nothing really changes. Um, so as far as an author, um, I might go deeper into each subject. Um, I was talking to somebody the other day, um, about, you know, we're talking about the central American issue and I think what we kind of came down to is, you know, how about if we just skip the government and just go after the captains of the industry and the, and the uh, lobbyists and get these groups together with those nation leaders, those ambassadors, and say, and sit down and discuss it. Okay, here's the idea. Will it work, number one? And then how do we do it? You know, and, you know, and the fellow I was talking to, he's in the media, and I'm like, you know, we can even, you know, publicize this. You can sit there and do, you know, YouTube episodes or something. I mean, I'm not in involved with the media. I'm just you know, retired Sergeant Major from the U.S. Army with a master's in national security, you know, and that's, you know, that's my background. And, um, you know, I just, I don't really want to get heavily involved in the media. Um, you know, I, I love talking to you guys and doing this. Um, but other than that, people have asked me, you know, you should run for office. And I said, I would love to. The only problem is D.C. doesn't want to fix it. You know, and I would just get up there and you would hear me on the, whether it be Fox or Newsmax or CNN or whatever, and they would just be bleeping every other word out as I'm getting, just getting more and more angry at the people I'm dealing with up there. And the last thing you want to do is anger your Sergeant Major, because I'm going to go Sergeant Major on you. Well, the book is absolutely amazing. Thanks for making some time for us today, my friend. And uh, I look forward to chatting with you soon. Before we let you go, how do people buy the book and find you online? Uh, well, you can buy the book on Amazon. Uh, we Are America, a voice from the silent majority. And it'll come up. You can't miss it. It's got the U.S. flag hanging right on it. It's a tattered flag because, well, these guys in D.C. are just beating it up. Yeah. And finding me on live, you're, you're not going to do. I am not on social media. I don't get on it. I got an email, and that's it. I'm that's not awesome. on LinkedIn. I'm not on Facebook. I'm not on anything. I got off all that stuff because I just got tired of the rhetoric and the arguments. It was just ridiculous. Well, the book is amazing. We are America. John, have yourself a wonderful day, and I will talk to you soon. All right, James, you take care, buddy. Thank you, sir. There he goes. And- 